CloudDB, shaping your new normal. Welcome everyone to the 2021 APEC Groundbreakers Virtual Tour by Apaco UC. This year, our event will be the biggest one ever done with 144 sessions, including normal sessions, workshops, and hands-on labs from 100 different uh, speakers over 17 days. Also, it will cover sessions in four different languages. Please remember to register to as many sessions as you can. I would like to say thanks to all Oracle user groups in Java user groups that made this event possible, and also to our sponsors, Oracle Groundbreakers, and your main sponsor, CloudDB. Now for today's session, Oracle Audit Vault and Database Firewall 20.5, live and in action by Gavin Sorma. Please feel free to ask questions at any time by using the chat window in the right lower uh, uh, session of your screen and the speaker will be answering uh, your questions at his convenience. If you have any issues during the presentation, please feel free to use the same chat window, and I will try to help you the best I can. Without any more further ado, I want to leave you with this amazing session by Gavin Sorma. Gavin, it's all yours. Uh, thanks, Dr. Francisco, and welcome, everyone, wherever you get it. Hope everyone's having a good day or a good evening. Uh, today's session is going to talk about Oracle Audit Vault and there is Firewall. Uh, I think the brochure did mention release 20.4, but I've just updated it to 20.5, which is the most recent version of AVDF. So I refer to Audit Vault and Database Firewall hence on as AVDF. All right. So before we get started, so I'm going to show you a demo, and I'll try to spend as much of time in the demo. So I have it running on VirtualBox. I hope it behaves itself. Uh, I'll just give you a brief history about the product. So before I start, yes, it's a licensed product. So very often people ask, do I need to pay for this? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is yes. So it's part of the Oracle Advanced Security suite of products. Uh, and uh, Audit Board has been around for quite some time. Actually, it's been there for more than 15 years, and it started off as Audit Board 10. Uh, it was actually uh, uh, acquired by Oracle from another company called Sukarno. It was called Sukarno SQL Firewall. And then Oracle uh, took the, uh, basically acquired Sukarno and has been developing and announcing the product as we go along. So we had versions 12.1, 12.2, and now we have versions 20. And uh, almost every few months, uh, we see a new version of 20 coming out. So that's why I mentioned uh, uh, the most recent version as of now is 20.5. And maybe by the time we finish the session, there's already 20.6. So uh, watch this page. This product is being announced quite rapidly. So as mentioned earlier, to recap, it's a licensed product. So it's part of the Oracle Advanced uh, Security suite of products. Uh, and the current version is 20, uh, release 5. So why would I want to do auditing and monitoring? So you have other products of advanced security, like uh, you do have transparent data encryption, you have key vault, et cetera. So Audit Vault has its own unique space. Uh, typically, I want to monitor user activity. I also want to monitor not just user activity, but privileged users who have DBS, who are my super users. I want to know what they're doing. Uh, I want to track operations on sensitive data. So a very nice tool has come out. I'm sure most of you guys have used it. It's called DBSAT or Database Security Assistant Tool. And that's a free product that we can actually go and download for my article support. And what we can do with DBSAT is that we can help and identify what we classify as sensitive data, data that may be having credit card information or maybe salary information, human resource records information, medical records, so you decide what you classify as sensitive. And once we have classified data as sensitive, we want to then track what operations are happening on that sensitive data, who's making uh, selecting from those tables, or is the select coming from a particular IP? Is it coming from a particular time of day? Is a particular DB of mine selecting sensitive data when they should not be accessing that data? So these are all the uh, use cases that audit all can be really put to. Uh, if I use something called Golden Gate, yes, I can capture changes that happen in real time. So it captures all my insert update delete statements. But my requirement may be to also go one step further. I want to know, yes, uh, a row has been updated, but what was the value prior to the update? 
So with Audit Ward, we can also track before and after changes. Uh, so it may be useful for maybe an application that deals in currencies. I want to know what the value of the currency was six hours back, now, yesterday, a week before. So with Audit Ward, you can track and also report on any kind of uh, modification to data values, all right? Uh, report on login failures. Uh, am I seeing somebody trying to log in all the time with the wrong password? Or is it happening maybe outside business hours on the weekend? Somebody is trying to access the database system or sys. And also very, very important, I need to know what privileges are being granted to my users, which privileges have been used, and has anything changed on the privilege grant side as uh, what Audit World does, it, it calls it as entitlements, and we will see in the demo of something called an entitlement report, where we can actually go and see what privileges have changed between the baseline and when you want to actually compare that baseline with. So I want to know, last week I had a set of users who were granted X privileges, and now something has changed, I ran an update, or I ran, ran a new release of an application, that also granted a lot of privileges to users, I want to know what has changed since that baseline now. So it presents all this information in very user-friendly reports. And you will see that part of the beauty of the products is that the reports are very, very, uh, very rich in terms of easy to use. And it can be basically accessed even by our auditors. So very often what happens as a DBA, maybe once, twice a year, you have auditors coming in and then you have to go and grant them access. You have to create user accounts in your database, grant them certain privileges, and then those auditors go and do their work and typically what happens, those accounts remain forever. Those privileges granted to the auditors remain forever. So here with the audit board, ABD product, there is a distinct separation of responsibilities. As we would see, we have an admin auditor, uh, an admin user, and we just have a normal auditor user. So you'll see that there's total separation of duties between what the admin can do and what just the, the player auditor can do. Uh, very often I want to know, has any code changed? I'm deploying lots of new code all the time, and suddenly my application has stopped working after the last uh, release update happened. I want to know what lines of code have been changed in a particular procedure or package. So I can also do that with audit code as well. And very often our requirements as a DBA is to provide reports to satisfy some clients, uh, like maybe SOX or it could be PCI. So very often, like I mentioned earlier, you have auditors coming in and they are auditing the database for some specific compliance or re regulatory requirements. So these are all the different use cases that a typical auditing product would need to satisfy. And we would see that at the end of the session, we would be happy to say that the audit award and database firewall product uh, typically will satisfy all these requirements for auditing and monitoring. So there's two products here. We talk about the audit board and we talk about the firewall. They bundle together as what's called the AVDF product. So in terms of infrastructure, uh, you have two different servers. You have what's called a firewall server, and you have what's called the audit wall server. So on my virtual box environment, right now I have three VMs running. One VM is dedicated to the audit wall. One VM is dedicated to the firewall. And my third VM is where I'm going to connect from a Oracle Lightning C database. So do I need all, both database firewall and audit wall? It depends on your, on your requirements. But for database firewall, you need the audit wall server. But if you don't want to run database firewall, you can just go ahead and just deploy the audit wall server. And maybe at a later point in time, you go and add the firewall server to it. So the database firewall server serves a certain purpose. We have a look at that. So you have two machines and in terms of setup, you would find, I have a couple of screenshots of an installation that has been done. Uh, all you have to go to do is to go into my article support or go to e-delivery and download the ISO image. So you have an ISO image for the firewall, you have an ISO image for the, uh, for the audit wall server, and you may want to deploy it on VMware or do you have, you may have a bare metal machine. What the ISO image does, it has everything in it, right from the Linux operating system right down to grid infrastructure, right down to your database. So the installation does everything for you. It goes and installs the Linux operating system, the grid infrastructure with the required patches. It goes and creates the repository database for you. And basically everything is just done through one single ISO. So the installation is very, very easy. It's very efficient. Uh, and the same thing goes for the firewall. So they kind of two different ISO images. So 
you just have to mount the ISO on your machine or your VM, and then you start up the VM, and then it basically boots up from that ISO image, and then the installation progresses. Uh, I'll just show you maybe later down the line a couple of screenshots on the solution, but in terms of uh, what you have to do, all you have to do is provide a network IP address, that's it. So you provide an IP address for your Hollywood wall server, and then you provide an IP address for the firewall server if you install it in the firewall server, and that's it. And everything is handled by the installer automatically for you. So in terms of what databases supports, so it typically supports all the standard RDMS that are out there, so MySQL, SQL Server, uh, IBM DB2, SAP, MySQL, Postgres, all these are supported and I've seen with every successive release, you find something else supported, like you say Teradata or Informix or whatever, you see that that list is growing all the time. So it's not just for monitoring and auditing of the Oracle database or any other databases, it's also for operating system, directory services, so with AVDF, you can also go and audit your operating system, whether it's Windows or Linux. Or also, you can go and connect your Windows AD to it if you want to audit what's happening at the AD level as well. So it supports uh, lots of different uh, options, so not just databases, but also your operating system directory services. And you can write your own custom code to add additional targets. So uh, by default, the product comes with what's called some plugins. So we have a plugin for Oracle database, you have a plugin for, say, Linux operating system, for Solaris operating system, for Windows E. And if you find that that is not suiting your requirements, you can write your own custom uh, collection through uh, with the XML code. Okay. So what's happening at the background is that your application, uh, if you have the database firewall in place, your users of the application would connect through the firewall and then file it into your Oracle database or what my SQL database or SQL Server database as the case may be. Uh, so the firewall, as I mentioned, is optional and you can run the firewall in a couple of different modes. I'll come to that in a, in a, in a different slide. But uh, just talking ahead, you can run the firewall in blocking mode or you can just run the firewall in monitoring mode. So what does your audit vault do? It has a, has a repository. So when you install the product, it goes and creates a database for you, it goes and creates a user for you. And that user is called AVSYS and it has a number of tables. Uh, the most important table is a table called event log that goes and stores all your information. So once the data is stored in the repository, I can do a number of things. I can generate alerts, I can create my own policies, I can generate reports. So this is coming out from your repository data that's stored in the audit wall server. So the targets will be sending the data through what's called agents. So I install the agent on the target. So let's do my target in this case is, the, is my Linux machine. When my Oracle database is running, then that same agent uh, can be used for sending data for the, at the OS level as well as at the database level. So I'll show you how to actually go and enroll a database. So there's a certain procedure that needs to be followed. I have a few commands and I'll uh, try to cover how to uh, enroll a database for a report. So once the target has been enrolled, the agent is running. What the agent does, it will basically poll. So what's it going to poll? So if it's an Oracle database, it will go and poll, poll the unified audit period tables. Uh, and if it's, say, the Linux uh, operating system, it will go and look at the audit log under var log audit. And it will be sending this data at regular intervals up to the audit report repository. So the good thing out here is that uh, we don't have to worry about space being utilized in, let's say, an Oracle database. So if I turn on auditing for many different things, many options, then possibly my sysops table space or the table space that holds my unified audit tables can get pretty much full. But what happens here is once I integrate this database now with audit world, as soon as the data is moving to the audit world repository, you can uh, you can configure jobs. So there's uh, a relationship between your your database and audit world server. So the uh, the audit world server knows what data has come to the repository, and then that data can be cleaned out from the database, say Oracle database. It's not required to be stored locally. So I don't have to worry about my table space running on space. Uh, you just have to configure a couple of jobs, and then do those jobs will keep purging the audit board, not audit boards, but the unified audit trail tables, because now the data is present in the audit board repository. So that much can be pretty much automated. Uh, you don't have to really worry about it. So data is moving all the time from your database into the audit board repository. 
So I did mention the supported targets. Uh, so this was the last one I took from the documentation and uh, maybe it's, it'll be changing in the next few versions, but you see most of the standard pairs are covered here. And as mentioned earlier, it's not just for databases, but also for directory services, uh, for file systems. So if you have Oracle ACFS, it's supported. Windows AD is supported. Uh, a number of different operating systems like Solaris, Linux, Windows, all of them are supported, in addition to our standard databases. So as mentioned in the slide here, the supported target list is the beginning, not the end. So you can write your own code as well to send data into ABDF. So very often I want to monitor privilege user activity. Uh, so it has been seen in uh, various, through various researches then that one of the biggest threats uh, an organization, organization faces is not external, but it's pretty much internal. So I need to know like if my elevated users have certain privileges, I need to know what are they doing with those privileges. So monitoring my privileged users is very, very important. So we have some very nice uh, user-friendly reports available in AVDF where, where I can see what are these privileged users doing. Uh, so there's a separate report just for previous users. So I can also check to see something called data exfiltration. So exfiltration means I can set a limit on the number of rows, which I consider to be normal. So let's assume that I have a table. Uh, and if somebody selects uh, 100 rows from the table, I would consider that to be normal. But if I see selects from these tables accessing 100,000 rows or maybe a million rows, then I want to know why is that person running that query. So this is called data exfiltration. So I can also put in alert policies to help me detect when such data exfiltration is happening, and I can be alerted as well when such event does happen. Very often what happens is that I need to find out what happened after an incident. So you don't, you don't have privy to the incident when it happens, but you are basically called in to do a lot of fact finding after the incident has happened. So I want to know like who did what, when, and where. So that information now is all available to me in my audit board repository data. I can run reports. And you'll see that this entire application is built on Apex. So guys have used Apex before. You'd find that a lot of the screens would seem very similar, how you run reports, how you can put filters in. So the entire application is built on Apex. So I can use AVDF to drill down to the activity of interest. I can see, okay, I want to drill down to a particular user on a particular date, from a particular IP address, and who's accessing a particular table. So I can go down to that level of granularity with AVDF. So you can also configure alerts. So one of the uh, features of the product is to configure alerts. So you can decide what kind of alerts you want. You can write your own code. So I'll show you some simple examples of alerts that are configured. And the possibilities are pretty much endless what you can do with alerts. You can, you can have your own alerts for a variety of different things. All you have to do is just write out some Oracle code for that, SQL code for that. So if there, if there are too many login failures, or if uh, somebody is logging in for uh, too many times from a particular IP address, or if they're connecting from uh, at certain times of the day, or somebody is logging in on the weekend and accessing maybe sensitive HR information. So you can basically put a lot of filters in and you can decide how do I want to configure these alerts. So if you're familiar with the syscons text, uh, article command, you can basically put any kind of uh, attributes in like IP address, time of day, week, weekday, user, client program. So one of the best practices which the, uh, we do with AVDF is that we want to monitor activity that's coming directly, say. So if the activity is through the application, I have no issue with that. But if somebody is connecting, say, via SQL Plus and directly accessing the database, I want to know. So you can also filter based on your client program as well. So. There's lots of flexibility in how you can go and configure that. And typically one of the main requirements for AVDF is even if I'm not really interested in monitoring suspicious activity, but I need, I'm a financial institution, I need to comply with certain statutory requirements in terms of audit. So all that information now is easily available to my auditors. I don't have to go and create database user accounts. I don't have to grant any privileges. 
I just have to go and create an account in uh, a record and the person then has access to the required reports. So I don't have to go and write complex SQL that is going to be there forever. People tend to forget about such reports and they lie there. I go and create these custom indexes or I go and create some views. And typically what happens after the auditor has done his job, those indexes remain and what these additional indexes are going to do, it's going to impact my DML on the, on the table, for example. So one of the big advantages of EBDF is that it allows the auditor self-service access, so they can pretty much do access a wide variety of reports without having to ask the DBA, listen, I need to have information about this at this time of the day or how the data was last year, month or whatever. So all the, the information is now available to the uh, auditor themselves. So I did mention this earlier. So if you're using Golden Gate, for example, there's now a lot of integration between Golden Gate and ABDF. And uh, we can also have one of the targets so for ABDF to be the transaction log, okay, and also the Golden Gate trail files. So the, the before and after values of, of a certain row is stored in the Golden Gate trail file. And then that can be viewed through EBDF via a simple report. So I'm able to see for this particular row, what was the before value, it was updated, now what's the after value. So uh, I can also do what's called transaction log working as well. So in terms of uh, uh, working with EBDF, I just have to configure my targets and then I have to find my trails. The trail could be uh, the audit trail coming from the database. It could be, like I mentioned, the uh, the uh, audit audit log on your Linux uh, operating system, for example. It could be the network. So with firewall, uh, I think there is another slide after this. Uh, we can actually configure the firewall to uh, operate in a couple of ways. One is in what's called monitoring mode, where it doesn't go and block somebody, but I'm just I'm, I'm monitoring whatever traffic is coming into my database through a particular maybe network interface. I'm actually monitoring that and recording that somewhere, and then I can go and analyze that. Then if I find that some activity is suspicious, I can then go and enhance the firewall now to move from monitoring mode into what's called blocking mode. So uh, with blocking mode, you can actually limit a person from accessing a particular table, for example, or you can also substitute the SQL shape when they run. So in the demo, I'm going to show you an example where I set up the firewall. And then when somebody runs the SQL statement that's accessing a sensitive table, he wants to select the salary or he wants to select the email, that SQL statement has been transformed because I have written a particular firewall policy that goes and transforms the SQL statement automatically on the fly. So the sensitive information is hidden uh, without me having to go and touch the code. So I'm not going and changing I'm not going and creating a view of the database, or I'm not going to write any kind of trigger to go and change the SQL statement when the user runs it. But with the firewall, now I'm running the firewall in what's called blocking mode or substitution mode. You can go and transform a query on the fly, or you can block the query totally. So with uh, the uh, database firewall, you can prevent something called denial of service or SQL injection attacks quite easily. So I configure my targets and then I define what policies I want. So audit policies. And then once that is done, I can go and generate my reports. And if I want, I can go and create a lens as well. So the auditing can be based on a table. So that's my unified audit tables. Or it could be based on a, a directory. It could be based on an operating system file. It could be based on read loss transaction logs as well. And once the data is collected, uh, I can then view that data that's stored in the audit report repository through the AVDF console. So the second part of AVDF, so we talked about the audit board. The second part was the firewall. And with the firewall, I can also do a lot of things. So these are one of the typical use cases. I want to uh, block traffic, I want to monitor what SQL traffic is coming, is it coming from the IP address that I can consider to be unsafe or suspicious, in that case I can do something, I can go and transform the SQL statement, I can block it totally if I want. So I can then whitelist SQL traffic, so I know this is my SQL traffic, that, uh, SQL statement that's whitelisted, and then if somebody is running a SQL statement that's not in this uh, whitelisted 
white list of SQL statements, then I can decide, okay, I need to block that particular SQL statement now. So there's lots of flexibility in how you go and deploy the firewall. So three modes in which you can run the firewall. So something called host monitor, what actually host monitor does, it's just monitoring the traffic that's coming on a particular network interface. So it monitors the traffic and then is sending that information to the audit wall server. So the audit wall repository is getting populated with all the different IP addresses, for example, or maybe it has other attributes like username or uh, which client is this, this traffic is coming from. All the data is now going into the uh, audit board repository. And now once the data is there, I can go and analyze it. And then that's, after analyzing it, I may decide I want to take some action now because I find some traffic that's coming into this database to be suspicious in nature. So then I can transform the uh, firewall from just monitoring mode into blocking mode. So with blocking mode, I can actually go and transform from SQL statements if I want with with host monitor, it's just actually monitoring. So I'll show you how to actually do that through the console. Uh, and in this example, we are running the database firewall in what's called the blocking mode. So just to uh, reiterate, you don't need to run database firewall, it's optional. But if you want to run database firewall, obviously the audit wall server has to be up and running as well. So here's the actors, the actions, and then I can decide is, is a risk critical, is a risk tolerable? So do I want to just log it or do I want to do something like go and block the statement? So I can decide how I want to actually go about, with it, go about it with the database firewall. Once I know who my actors are, what the IP address is, where they're coming from, what the OS uses, what the database uses, I can then go and create what's called a database firewall policy. And then once the policy is in place, I can then decide then what action to take. So I know the actor, I know what actions the actors are taking. And now I can take my own action as a AVDF administrator and decide how to actually go about blocking this particular threat that's coming. So with uh, firewall, I can have what's called a whitelist. And if I see some kind of statement that doesn't appear to be on my whitelist SQL statements, I can go and block it. So, for example, somebody is trying to do a SQL injection attack. So, my standard application SQL statement would be select start and stop, where catalog number column is equal to some value. But if somebody is trying to do a union, is trying to do some kind of select where, uh, you know, you can make out that this select statement is not really a SQL statement that the application typically runs, I can then go and, and go and block the statement and it prevents something called uh, SQL injection uh, or denial of service uh, type of scenarios happening from my database. So I'll try to show you the screen for the high availability, but it's very, very simple with what they do here. In fact, everything is, uh, is done behind the scenes. You just go and click on a button, enable high availability. And what it does in the background, it goes and configures DataGuard for us. So it goes and creates a standby database. So obviously we need to have two servers. If I want, I can have high availability for just the audit wall server and not the firewall server. Or maybe I want to have high availability for both audit wall as well as my firewall service. So remember, in terms of the topology, we have different servers for audit wall. And we have different servers for the firewall. So we can't combine both in the same server they are two distinct individual servers. So when I configure high availability for say the audit port, uh, I would, before creating the, enabling the high availability, I'll try to show you the screen for that. I already, already need to have uh, an existing audit port server that's up and running. And then with my console, I designate which uh, server is primary, which server is going to be my standby. And then what it does internally, when we click on a button called initiate pairing, it goes about and uh, uh, goes and creates data card for us automatically. So it does the data card setup. So the audit wall repository is now available on not one server, but two servers. And I can do standard data card operations like switchovers and failovers. Uh, and it's all done behind the scenes video. So just on a click of a button, I can switch over from one audit wall server to another. So high availability is pretty much well built into the product. 
So we'll have a look at the console and we'll see that a lot of reports are available to us. So the report set is very rich. Okay, so there's reports on activity. So I want to see activity by just normal users. I want to see activity by privileged users. I want to know who's running selects, who's modifying data. I also want to see, like, if I have integration with Golden Gate set up, I want to know the modification before value and modification after value as well. I want to know, like, who's logging in, who's logging out. I can also have that information as well. I want to monitor and report on failed login attempts, startup and shutdown, and some database has been shut down, plug the database has been started up. So all that information is also available. Uh, in terms of uh, privileges, so in EBDF, this is called entitlements. And I can generate a report on entitlement. So I want to know who my privileged users are, who have been granted DBA, who's been granted uh, selecting table privilege, for example, and it also has information about object level privileges. So right now, what we can do with our standard, uh, maybe just basic queries, we can go and see what uh, privileges the particular user has. What we don't have available to us out of the box is what privileges did he have yesterday? What has changed? Okay. So uh, I want to know, like, what extra privileges have been added to a, to a user maybe in the last few days because an application release has happened and in that release uh, a user was created and maybe they have given the DBA role to that user. So I want to know like based on a baseline, what entitlement has changed. So that's very important uh, from the point of view of uh, auditing and uh, privilege uh, access, privilege activity. Uh, once we have configured the firewall, I can get a lot of reports as well. So if I'm running it in just host monitoring mode, uh, I'm very interested in seeing what traffic is coming into my database. And with the reports, I can get a lot of information. I can analyze it by OS user. I can analyze by time of day. I can analyze by IP address, etc., etc. So I can just go and uh, change the report. I'll show you the hot ground reports very easy. Uh, standard Apex reports, and you can just click on filters. And you can save those reports if you want. So once you have to find some customization for a report, you can save it, you can schedule it. You can also integrate it with email. So I want a failed report, uh, failed login report to be sent to the security manager every morning at 9 a.m. It will show you all failed login attempts the last 24 hours. You can go and automate that and schedule that. And then that report is being sent as an email attachment to whoever you want. So you can create your own email notification list, you can have your email notification templates, you want the email content to be in a particular way, you can create your notification template, and then once the report is scheduled, it just gets sent automatically. Uh, in terms of stored procedures, I want to know what has changed in terms of code for a particular package or procedure or a trigger. Again, you have baseline, and then from that baseline, what has changed? So it's up to you if you want to run these reports as well. Uh, you would see also there's a lot of reports at the OS level, so if I've enabled uh, auditing for the OS, uh, very often what I want to know is I've given pseudo privilege. So once a pseudo privilege has been given to a user and they connect to a database, so typically what happens in many organizations, you'll connect uh, to the uh, machine uh, via party, for example, using your network ID. And then once you connect by your network ID, then you do a pseudo to Oracle. Then once you pseudo to Oracle, you then connect to the database. But then very often, after connecting to the database, you're going to run some statements. And quite often, that visibility is not there. Yes, I know the pseudo happened at 10.51. Somebody connected uh, as their staff number, and then they did a pseudo to Oracle, and then they ran some SQL statements in the database. But very often, I don't have visibility of what was run in the database after the pseudo was provided. So with AVDF, it also tracks the pseudo access as well and transition. So when I transition from user A to user B and then issue some SQL statements, I can also generate a report on what SQL statements have been run after the pseudo was done. So a very good report here is a trend. So I want to know has activity changed on a particular day. I can then just click on that particular day's activity and then I can drill it down. I want to know what has changed suddenly. So there's very nice uh, user-friendly charts that are available. Um, again, I'll try to show you this in the demo. Uh, just click on that particular page, and you'll see what was the uh, breakdown of audit records for the particular day. Was it based on some uh, user activity? Was it based on some system activity or job as well? 
So you can actually go and drill down right to the very minute details as well. So this is the user interface, so we're going to have a look at this in a minute. And uh, you'll see in the top right, it shows you who you actually connected as. So when you go and install EBDF, all you have to do after the installation is des designate two users. One is the admin user and one is the basic quality user. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a total uh, separation of responsibilities and duties, what the administrator does and what the auditor does. So in this case, I have two users. One is called EBDF and so ABM, that's my administrator. And I have another user called ABDF underscore AUD, uh, and that's my auditor user. So uh, when you connect as the administrator, you'll see a different interface. When you connect as your auditor, you'll see a different interface. So the administrator is responsible for a few things, like setting up the targets, setting up the trails. So you don't like, actually run reports with the administrator, you run reports with the auditor user. So this is an example of uh, one of the interfaces you'll see when you connect as the admin user. So you have information for the targets, the audit trails, the agents, Etc. And when I connect as the auditor, I get different kind of uh, interface. So I get information about alerts, I get information as about who's what my top five users are, uh, what are the diff different jobs that are running, what's the kind of what kind of activity is happening. So in terms of actual audit activity, monitoring it and reporting on it, you connect as the uh, auditor user, not as the administrative user. So you can see information going back a week one month, two months. Uh, we'll talk about retention uh, as well. So with uh, the ABDF, you can decide how long you want to retain the audit data for. Maybe in your case, I need to retain audit data for one year or seven years, or I just need it for one month. So you can decide what is my retention policy and what is my purging policy. So two things you do here, when you define a retention policy, you define how long data is going to remain online. That means I can see it in my console and how long data remains offline or archived. So once I have archived data, then it's not visible in my console until I go and retrieve it. So I can decide how long I want data to be online for, how long I want it to be archived for, and once that archive period is completed, then the data gets purged automatically. So in the background, it does a lot of what's called ILM stuff. So that's called information lifecycle management. Uh, and that automatically happens uh, through jobs that EBDF configures. So you would find that what it does is that every day there's a job that goes and partitions the data based on a particular of the day, sorry based on a day. So for every day it has a different partition, and then based on your archiving and retention policies, it moves the uh, partitions from the say the, the event log is the main table. So what you see in, in your uh, console is all coming from a, a table called central central table called event log and then it moves it from the event log table, it moves it into what's called an archive table. So you just designate where is your uh, destination for your archival data, so it can be your NFS for example, and then what it does, it goes in uh, offline the table space with those particular partitions, and moves that data say to NFS, it remains there for the uh, archiving period, so if you want, suppose somebody comes along and says I want to see data for last month, and you define one month online and one month archival. So that means my current month's data is online, it's visible in the console. And if somebody wants to go and see older data, older data I would have to go into the console and retrieve that data. But if somebody says I want data more than two months old, then that's not possible because after one month of archival, that data gets purged. So one of your jobs as the AVK Backlist Twitter is to define what's called data protection and purging policies. So I'm just showing you where you can actually go and uh, obtain the product. So if you just go into e-delivery uh, and you can go and uh, select the version. So at this, uh, I think this was the screenshot is from an earlier point in time. Uh, 20.5 has been out for about a month now. So you do have uh, different earlier versions of 20 as well. And if you just go and select that, it downloads a couple of IS images. Uh, one ISO image is for the audit call server, and the other ISO is for the firewall. So in terms of size, uh, I think about 14 GB is the total. So one ISO is 13 GB. That is the ISO for the audit call. And the database firewall ISO is very small. But in terms of disk space, guys, if you want to size up on your laptop, uh, it's pretty hungry. So you need to have at least 8 GB of RAM. 
and 225 or 230 GB of disk space available for the installation. Otherwise, the installation doesn't go ahead. So right now, uh, I'm using quite a lot of my disk space for these two servers, one for the firewall and one for the audit wall server. So uh, the installation will not go ahead unless it, unless it finds 230 GB of disk space available. Uh, recommended uh, RAM is uh, 16 GB, but you can work with 8 GB as well. So if you want to try it on your laptops, just make sure you have enough RAM. And all you have to do then is once you download the ISO, you go and create your VM. So whether it's in VMware, if you're using VirtualBox, or if you have an actual machine, then you have to ensure that it boots up from the ISO image and you'll see a screen like this. And all you have to do pretty much is just say enter and it goes ahead and does the installation for us. So all you have to do is actually go come here to one of the screens uh, and enter your uh, IP address of the network and then it goes and installs everything automatically. So one of the things it does is it installs grid, it installs ASM, it installs the patches, it goes and creates the, it installs the Oracle software for the database, it goes and creates a single instance database uh, that is non container based, okay, so it's non CDB. Uh, even though we have grid infrastructure, it's, uh, it's single instance, it's not direct based. Uh, and uh, Pretty much it does everything for us after that. So all we're doing is just entering the uh, network IP address details. And from that point on, everything is automated. So we do the same thing for the firewall uh, as we did for the Oracle also, but we find that the uh, firewall pretty much doesn't do much in the database. So in terms of time, it takes, to, on my machine, it took about three hours to do installation. There's a lot of stuff in the background. Uh, so it may vary, but I've done it on a, uh, for an organization as well, it took about an hour and a half to do to, to the entire process. So with that, I'll break from the slides and hopefully try to show you guys a demo of the product. So I hope my virtual box is going to behave while I show you the demo. So just bear with me while I lighten up the screens. So right now I'm connected to one of my VMs, so I have three VMs running, and I have a, a database here. So this is my, uh, you can see out here, this is the audit call server. And uh, one of the things you can actually do after the installation is go and change the host name, otherwise it creates its own host name for you. So if I do a ps minus ef, So you can see there's an ASM uh, instance running and there's also the firewall and database or repository database. So that contains all my repository data, right? So that is my audit wall repository and my target machine is this machine out here. So I've written a couple of scripts that will go and generate some audit workload and we'll see what happens when it does that. So right now I have Deploy the agent, so I'll just show you the agent is running. So you deploy the agent, I'll show you how to deploy the agent in a minute. But the agent is running on my machine, so what the agent is doing, so it, it's pretty much lightweight, maybe about 300 MB of disk space. And because I'm also doing OS level uh, auditing, so it needs access to the wireless wallet. So that's where the audit records for the next uh, operating system is kept. I need to basically run the agent as root. Otherwise, if I'm not doing OS auditing, if I'm just interested in the OS auditing, then I can start the agent as a standard Oracle user. So in terms of what I need to install on my machine, uh, on my targets, is just the audit board agent. So right now, we're going to work with two servers. So this is my target, and this is my audit board repository. So let's have a look and see from the top. So the first thing we have to do after the installation I mentioned to you is to create the users that we designate as the auditor and the uh, administrator. So as soon as you do the installation, a screen will pop up where I connect as root. So I connect initially as root. And in, so I did mention you have to provide only networks, but you rephrase that again. You have also to provide the root password. So that's all you have. That's the only two user inputs that you need to provide when the installation is going on. So you provide the root password, and after the installation is over, you connect as root through the web console, and then it deploys a page, and in that page, basically, you specify information about maybe the 
the password for root, and there's another user called support. So you can't actually go and SSH to the other server's root. You have to SSH first as a user called support, and then from the support user, you do a sudo to root. Okay, so let's assume now that part has been done. So I need to first go and uh, uh, install my agent. So to install the agent, you go and actually download the software. So you can see the software is working for different operating systems here. So I can go and download the software. Uh, so this host monitor is for what I mentioned, the uh, monitoring of the firewall traffic. So if I want to uh, monitor firewall traffic, I'm not blocking it, then I need to install the agent plus something called the host monitor. So the host monitor is basically looking at the traffic coming into a particular inter interface and then while that agent sending that information to the audit or repository for us to run some reports on it. So let's assume we're not using post monitor in this case. I just have to go and download the audit board agent. You can see it's pretty small. And then a simple Java command to go and install the agent or installation of the agent. All I'm doing is specify the directory where the uh, agent software will be stored. So once the agent has been downloaded and stored, you'll see out here. So when you do the installation, it will ask for this particular activation key. So you provide this only once when you start the agent the first time. So initially it will be showing with the status as uh, just, uh, I think, registered. And once you actually start the agent with the uh, activation key, uh, and if there, there's no errors, it starts up, the status will change to running. So you can see out here. Uh, in this case, of course, monitor has also been installed. And this is the location of the agent, this is the version, etc. etc. So once I've done the agent installation, I go and configure my targets. So download the agent, install the agent, and then after that I go into my targets and register targets. So right now you'll see that I have one agent running, but that one agent is having two targets. One is the machine itself called db01, so that's the main the name of the Linux machine. And I'm interested in auditing a particular private database called PDB1. So I have two targets. So if I want to go and register another target, I will just have to click on that. And you can see out here, these are all the different supported targets. So I mentioned it's not only for databases, it's also for Active Directory, it's for ACFS. You can see uh, the different operating system it supports and also the different databases it supports. So you select the, uh, the target, and let's assume the target was uh, the Oracle database. Uh, you provide the name for the target, the IP address, the port, uh, the service name. So if you're running Rack, for example, you provide the scan name. And we have to go and create a user in the particular database. So in terms of uh, enrollment for, of a database, just bear with me. I'll try to show you some uh, notes on how to go about to enroll a database. But what we'd have to do is to create a user, and in my case, I call it AVDF user. And uh, when you deploy the agent, you connect to the database that you're going to do your audit, and you will have to go and create a user, and just grant it a few privileges that are there uh, that come under with the agent. I'll show you that in a minute. So once you have the agent uh, user created, you just enter, enter the user out here, and that's all you have to do to go and just select that particular target. So if I go to this particular target, you'll have a look here. So this is my database. Uh, if I go into modify, you can see the same information I would, I would have provided when I went and registered the target. So the IP address, the port, the database username. Okay, so that's all I did. And you can see out here that when I go and create a database, not create a database, but create a database target, I have to specify the audit location. So where am I getting the audit data for that particular target? So in this case, it's, it is coming from the unified audit trail. So if I want to go and add a location, so you can see out here, these are the different options. So let's assume I'm, I've integrated this with Golden Gate. So in that case, I specify transaction log. And when I put it in transaction log, you have to specify the location of the trail file. So these are Golden Gate trail files. And where is the agent running? I specify that particular agent. Okay. So that is if I want to uh, use an order trail, if my requirement is to uh, monitor the before and after modification values for a particular row in a particular database. 
So you can see on here the different monitoring types. So if I want to do host monitoring, then my target now becomes network. So, sorry, the audit trail that becomes network. So I specify when I go to network, I need to specify the host and I have to specify. Uh, so in this case, if I specify DB01, that means when I've configured my host monitor on DB01, I already specified which network interface that host monitor should be actually monitoring. So first thing I need to do if I want to monitor network, uh, why would I want to monitor network? That's for my firewall. So I'm not running the firewall in blocking mode, I'm just running it in host monitoring mode. So I install the agent first and the host monitor. And when I install the host monitor, I have to specify the, uh, the NIC that I want to monitor. So any traffic that comes into the database through that NIC is then being sent on to the audit wall repository. Okay, so that is my target configured. I have my audit tray. And you can see out here, it's uh, there's two audit trails. One is directory. So in this case, my target is the NICS. The trail location is the audit log uh, file. It's located on the var log audit. And for my database, it's my Unified audit trail tables. So does it work with only Unified auditing? It, no, it also works with what's called traditional auditing. So I'll show you that in a minute as well. So Targets, agents, and here I also configured a firewall. So let's assume now we just install the audit wall server. Then I need to pair the audit wall server with a firewall. So I go into say register. So I've already done that. I'll just show you. So when I go to register, I specify a name and the IP address. That's it. So my firewall server should be up and running. The firewall should be able to communicate with the audit wall server. And then all I'm doing here is pairing them. So this firewall server is sending data to this particular audit wall server. So I can see out here, this is the IP address of my firewall server that's running uh, and the role is primary. So I can also run the firewall in, uh, in high availability mode. So I would have a primary firewall server and I would have a standby firewall server. So at, at this point in time, there is no pairs. Otherwise you would see a pair. So I will show you which is the primary, which is the standby. And in, uh, under settings, uh, you can do a couple of things. You can designate who is the administrator. Uh, storage, yes. So when you go and do the installation, what does in the backend? Like I said, it configures for infrastructure. Uh, it goes and creates three uh, ASM disk groups for you, and it allocates space automatically. You can go and add additional space if you want. So there's three disk groups. One is called event data, one is called system data, and one is called recovery. So the event data actually holds the audit uh, data. So typically all the, the tables under the ABC schema would be in the event data. And the system data would have your sysox type tables stored in the system data table space. So these are the three uh, ASM disk groups that are configured automatically. Uh, and then you can go and add additional disk space to these ASM disk groups as you would like. So you can see out here, this is my repository. I can go and add space to, to the ASM description I want. And let's have a look at archive. So this is what I just mentioned, where you can specify policies. So you can see out of the box, there are a number of policies that come. So you can see these are pre-configured, how many months online, how many months archived. And you can go and create your own custom policies. So you can see out here, if you there's no one month archive available, it's only one month online out of the box. So if I want to create a policy that has one month online, one month archive, I would have to go and create a custom policy. Okay, so this that's my policies. So I can see at this point in time, uh, I have a policy that's been that's used out of the box. So it's one year online and one year in archive. That means if I'm budgeting for space, I need to ensure that I have enough space to store two years of audit data. And there's a very nice tool that's available to my Oracle support. It's called the uh, AVDF Silent Tool. So it's like a spreadsheet. Now you download that and you put in the expected number of audit records per day per <coughs> database that you expect per day, how long you want to retain it, and some other parameters you have to pass in. And then it gives you the expected storage that would need to support audit data that has one month, sorry, one year of uh, online and one year of archiving. So you can go and change that to whatever you want. 
and then it goes and changes, uh, updates the spreadsheet automatically. So you can use that for budgeting, uh, disk space requirements. So I need to know how much of disk space I need now for this particular project. Then that spreadsheet is very useful for us. Uh, here I can specify my archive locations. I can specify where is my data going to be archived. So in this case, I have specified an NFS file server where the archive data is going to be stored. So that's the IP address of the NFS server. So what actually will happen is that when, in this case, I have a my policy one month online, one month archive. As soon as one month is expires, it goes and moves all the older partitions uh, from the uh, the immediate repository to this NFS location. It's stored there until the archiving period expires. If the archiving period expires, then that those table spaces are pretty much dropped. Uh, so as long as my archiving period is not expired, I can actually go in here and say retrieve. Okay, so I can go and retrieve it. I can specify when I want to retrieve it. So you can see out here, I have archived a particular table space. Uh, this has data for 2020 October. Now support says requirement to get data for that month. It's not available online. When I say online, it's not available in my console when I run reports. But if somebody has a requirement that I need data for this particular month, then all I have to do is go and retrieve this because it has not been purchased yet. So it's, it's available for me because uh, I'm using the default one year online, uh, one year archival policy. So data is still available, even though it's not online, it's available in the archive area, which is my NFS storage location. So uh, here is my retention. And now you can see there's a table space ready to be archived. So right now it's auto archive is set to disabled. If, if I enable it, then every month these table spaces are automatically archived. That means what happens? The data file for this table space is uh, taken offline and that table space is then written to the uh, copy to the NFS location. So what it does is take the table space offline. That means if you want a report for that particular month data, it will, you will not get it until that table space has been retrieved from the archival area. So I'm just trying to show you all the different uh, options that are available in the administrative interface. And I'll, have, I'll show you also ABCLI. So there's something called the command line. So what I'm showing you is the GUI. You can typically do a lot of stuff from the command line. So if you want to script things, if you have deployments, uh, that not just one server, two servers, but I want to deploy it over 100 different targets and I want to do that for a job, that job. You can actually script and you can actually invoke a tool called ABCLI, which is all it called, command line interface. And I'll try to show that as well. So you can either download it from here onto some other client, but if I want to run ABCLI, it's available on the audit call server. Uh, and if I want to run ABCLI from another machine, for example, I can download it from here. And as long as I have the supported Java version, I can run ABCLI from another server that connects to my audit call repository. So that was pretty much what I wanted to show you from the administrative point of view. So let me now connect as the auditor. So I can just log out from here and then I'm going to connect as the auditor. So when I connect as the auditor, I'm going to see a different interface out here. So I can see, okay, my audit trail is running, but if my audit trail was down, I can't go and start it up as my auditor. I need to do that as the administrator. So like I said, there's a, separation of uh, roles and responsibilities. Uh, now, just looking at this audit tool, I can see, yes, maximum activity is for the root user. Then I have some other users here. And if I look at my targets, uh, my main target right now is my machine called db01, and there's a pdb. So I can actually go and click on that. And that will only show me the activity for that particular target. Okay, so let's go through each of these one by one. And then I'll generate some load in my target database around my scripts, and we'll see how the data is coming into the audit world repository. So I'll just go very quickly through the menu here. So targets is what you see. So the targets is defined in the uh, um, at the administrator console, and you can see those targets out here. So you can't go and add targets, but what I can do now with this particular target is that I can go and see what uh, is my audit data, what is my firewall, what is my retention policy, so I can go and actually change the retention policy from here. So you can see, I can't go and create a retention policy. I have to do that in the administrative console, but once the policy has been created, I can go and then use it out here. So that is the uh, retention policy. 
Okay, so what does audit policy mean? So audit policy is the policies that are defined in my database, for example. If I go and create a new audit policy, uh, how often do I want to tell audit policy that a new policy has been created? I can schedule that or I can just do a one-time retrieval if I like. The same thing goes for my user entitlements, so these are my privileges. So what I would like to do is every week, I want to get information on my user entitlements, uh, and every week that information is going up to my audit policy. So then I can do week-to-week -week comparisons of what has changed for maybe my uh, object privileges or user privileges or my privileged users. Uh, and then I, I can have, if I have a baseline on a week, I can compare another week with the baseline data. So this is your user entitlements. I can either retrieve it once or I can schedule it. And the same thing goes for what's called stored procedure. So it's not only for just procedure, it's for all different code. So it's not limited procedures, but also packages, triggers, etc. So that's what I can do from here. If I go to firewall, I'm going to show you the firewall in a minute. So you can see out here, guys, I've configured my firewall in what's called blocking mode. Okay, so maybe I'll pick this quick from here. I'll go back and I think I missed the firewall part. Let me just show you how the firewall has been done. So I have a firewall running now in what's called blocking mode. So if I click on this particular name, so that's my IP address. And I'm going to go on to network settings. This is my interface of my firewall server. So what I've done is that I've created what's called a proxy port and I've defined a port as 15221. So just remember, 15221 is my proxy port. So if anybody connects uh, to my database using this port, that means they're coming in through the firewall. So I'm gonna show you a case where somebody connects to my database using the firewall. And then without the firewall, if they connect, how do they see the same data? So. Just remember this port number, 15221, it's what's called my firewall proxy port. And I have defined this in my database firewall setting. So this is what I do in the administrative side. And once that has been defined, I can then go and use it for a particular uh, database. So you can see how here is, if I can enter the auditor, I can see that firewall is in place for that particular target. So if I go to my target, which is pdb one go into firewall monitoring i can see it's in block traffic mode that's this is my firewall policy and this is the, the, the firewall that's being used and this is the proxy port okay. i can have a look at my audit trails but i can't go and stop and start it i can do it from the, uh, the admin console let's have a look at policies next So once I have the target defined, I want to know what audit data I want to audit in terms of sending it to my repository. So I can decide how do I want to do it. I can do it in either three ways. Out of the box, there are what are called Oracle predefined policies. This is there even when you don't have unified auditing. So you can see these are the standard policies that come with the Oracle database. And there are some policies that you can go and create on your own. So these they are called custom policies. And the third one is the policies that come bundled with the audit world server. So you will see that they have a particular naming convention. I think it is aura underscore 80 dollar and it has a name. So you can specify these are the policies that I want to enable. Okay, so you can see in there when you go and make a tick out here, in the background it goes and creates a policy for you in your database as well. So these are the policies that come with the, the middle one is the policies that come with the Oracle database. Uh, the extreme right of the custom policies are the policies you create. And on the left hand side is the policies that come with the audit wall server. So you can specify what policies you want to enable. And once you do that, you just click on this button here, provision unified policy, and it goes and provisions those policies. And those policies would then be enabled. So, so you define the target, and then you define what policies you want to enable. So that's been done. And I also have a policy for my firewall, so right now I can see this is my policy name. So what is this policy doing actually? I'm going to go and block the statement. So 
I'm just going to notepad, I'm going to show you that. So this is the, the SQL statement I'm going to run, guys. Okay, so that's the statement I'm going to run. But I consider HCM.employees employees to be a table that has sensitive data in it. And I want to go and not block it in the sense, I want to transform it so people can run the statement. But when they run this statement, uh, let's see actually what happens. So I'm going to connect first with this user right, <clears throat> using PDB1. So let's have a look at what's the difference between a PDB1 and another uh, DNS connect string I have defined. Okay, so when I do a DNS from a PDB1, you can see the host is DB01, that's my machine, but it's where this database is running. And the port is 1521. And I have defined another alias called PDB1 and it's called DFW. So let's have a look at the difference in that. You can see out here now the host is not the machine where the database is running, but the host is the IP address of the database firewall. The port now is not my standard 1521 port, but this is the port I've defined uh, for the firewall. So this is my proxy port. So now I'm going to connect as that user. So I'm going to connect first as this user, and I'm going to connect not using the firewall. Okay, and I'm going to run this query now. And as expected, it goes and returns all the, uh, the columns that are in the query. So this is my query and it's typically returned all the columns in the query. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect to the same user, but I'm going to use the alias for the firewall. So I'm going to connect now with the difference out here. So I'm connecting this PDB1 underscore DFW. So this is the alias that uses the proxy port. Now I'm going to go and run the same query, so I'm not changing anything. So can you see out here, all the sensitive columns that are defined are sensitive, are excluded. So even though the user has run this query, uh, because my firewall policy is in place, it has gone, gone and transformed that query, and you can define in the firewall, when you want to create the firewall policy, how you want that statement to be actually transformed. So maybe I can try to show you the definition of that policy. So I have a rule. So you can see out here, this is my rule. So when somebody runs a statement that I that have basically put a policy for. I'm going to go and change that and show only the first name, last name, manager ID, department ID. So even though uh, we're selecting a number of different columns from there, so you can see out here we are selecting phone number, email, hire date, salary, these are considered to be sensitive columns. Uh, what I'm doing is that I'm substituting the SQL statement on the fly uh, because now this traffic is coming in through my firewall and my firewall is running in what's called blocking mode. If it was in running in monitoring mode, then I would just monitor this SQL statement has been executed, and then that information is going into my repository, but I can't go and stop that SQL statement from actually happening. But if I'm running it in, say, monitoring mode, post monitoring mode, and I see a lot of SQL statements are happening for a particular IP address, and it is, it is accessing this particular sensitive column, I can then decide to put a policy in place that maybe blocks a particular IP address totally. So maybe when somebody runs a SQL statement, I can then just put an error message that will come up. So they will not see any data, for example, so I'm not doing transformation, I'm just doing pure blocking. So here what I'm doing is that I'm blocking with transformation. So I'm not actually blocking the SQL statement, I'm letting it run, but I'm transforming it while it runs. So that, guys, I hope you saw is the firewall uh, in action, and you can define whatever you want. So for example, session context could be like, you go and create what's called set, and in the set you can decide is it based on IP address? Is it based on the user? Is it based on the client program? I don't want anybody connecting from Tor to my database, for example. Anybody connecting from Tor, I want to block it. If the user is a developer and he's connecting via Tor, then I can write a firewall policy that goes and blocks that SQL statement from running. So you can uh, define whatever kind of rules you want, and then once you have those rules in place, you can then create policies based on those rules. So now uh, let's just see what happens to alerts. So you can see it out here, I've defined a, a policy with an alert and you can see that this alert has been triggered because somebody has tried to run this one. So if I go and look at this particular alert ID, I can see that an alert evaluated a database firewall based on firewall policy. 
this is the user that ran the SQL statement. And I can also drill down and see a lot of other information. What was the SQL statement they ran? What was the client IP? What was the OS user? What was the uh, database user? So all this information I'm getting actually now uh, stored in the audit world repository. So I can go into my alerts. So this is where I go and define alerts, which is very, very simple. So this is already one alert that's come because of the firewall. But now I have also defined two other alerts. And let's have a look at these alerts, very simple. So I've defined an alert that if there's more than five failed long attempts in one minute, go and generate an alert. And you can also send those alerts via email. So you can configure email. I don't have email configured at the moment. But if I had, I could also have a notification list. I could have an email template defined where I can basically customize how I want the email to be structured and who that email should be sent to based on a notification template. So you can see the condition out here. So it's if there's a failure for logon, and here I specify the threshold and the duration. So let's see if this alert actually is working now. So what I'm going to do is I want to try to uh, connect with the wrong password for this user. So I'm just going to run this, and this password I think is wrong. So I can see that there are six or seven attempts. So let's run this and let's see if the alert is generated and if the information is captured in the report. Okay, so I think I generated more than five now. So we can just give it a bit of time for it to come in here. And if you check maybe after a minute or maybe less, we'll see that an alert has been generated. And not only has an alert been generated, it will also come in one of our reports that we can see very soon. So that report is based on failed logins. So you go into policies, you define your firewall policies, your alert policies, and then based on the alert policies and firewall policies you define, you would get the alert showing up here and also showing up in your home page as well. So you can see out here, which are my alerts, and I can see there's lots of open alerts. That I click on that, it actually takes me into the uh, alerts page. All right, so that is a bit about the alerts, and now the main part of the tool is the different reports that we can get. So we'll just have a look at the different reports that are available. Uh, I can also save a report. I can then schedule a report. Like I mentioned, if I want to get fail login report to run every day at nine o'clock in the morning, I can save that report. Uh, schedule it and then specify who that report should be emailed to. So let's have a look at all activity. Now so this shows me my activity and you can see out here already it's captured this what we just ran. So this one is basically showing you everything. So I can see now there's been a failure to log in and I can go and see okay what actually happened. This is my policy guys. You can see the policy or our AV dollar admin user activity was the policy. So this is the policy that has been created because I specified that in my targets, if I go here, remember this one? Okay, so you have critical database activity, database schema changes, all that. So in the background, it goes and creates these policies with the aura underscore AV dollar name. So I want to see activity by privileged users now. So I can see, for example, these are my privileged users. So these are not the normal users. I can see now this user has got a log one failure. I don't have it uh, configured with Golden Gate, so I can't see my before after values, but if I go into uh, data modification, for example, I can see, for example, some commits happened, updates happened, this update was a failure. So you can see out here, it's this, I have got a policy specifying that only the HR user can do uh, an update. But here I can see a user called HR, it's called Jim, try to run a, an update. And I and actually can go and see the uh, statement that that user ran. So I can see this is the statement that this particular user ran. So you try to run an update statement, which obviously failed, you didn't have the privileges. And this policy that I created, so these are the custom policies. So if you don't see the AV dollar name in it, 
then it's not the policy that comes with the audit also, it's a custom policy. So you can see that this is my custom policy. And because of the custom policy, uh, it has trapped that particular failure of the update statement. So I'm just going to go and run some workload in my database, for example, let me see I have a script. So this script is basically just going to run some dummy uh, user activity, like somebody trying to delete the audit trail table, or somebody trying to connect the wrong class or doing things they shouldn't do. So I'm just going to go and run this now. And let's see what happens to my report. So I'm just running this. You can see somebody is trying to delete the unified audit trail. Obviously, they can't do it. So there you can see there's some errors for insufficient privileges, invalid using a password. So this is just some activity that's happening in your database. And I would see that you know, maybe 20 or 30 seconds the data will be coming into my repository. So the agent is sending the data and into the repository straight away it comes. So once it's in my repository, uh, let's have a look at some reports then based on that. So let's have a look at maybe fail log attempts. So you can see over here, this is almost the timestamp we just ran it. So this is a fail login. So you can see all the different fail logins that are there. Data access. So you can see these are what's been happening in terms of access. So these access is basically all the select statements. So if I'm interested only looking at who's selecting as opposed to who's modifying data, I also have a different report for that. An important uh, report I would see that from an auditor's point of view or administrator's point of view is who's doing audit policy activity, who's writing, trying to write new audit policies or trying to amend policies that are already being created. So I can see out here somebody is trying to do a no audit. So we can go and ask this person why you trying to do a no audit. So this is user called HCM and he tried to do a no audit, obviously it failed. So you can see the command that he ran, no audit all. So that command is going to fail. So I'm also auditing activity on my audit tables as well. So that's very really important. I want to know what audit policies are being modified. Somebody's trying to drop an existing audit policy. Suppose they connect, they have the required DBA privileges to go and create or maybe drop an audit policy. Uh, I'm also able to audit that kind of activity. I know what's happening in my database then. So I can go and save a report. So I, at this point, I have not saved any reports on this one. And I can go and schedule a report to run at a regular time. So if I go into activity reports, let's see how we can use the filter. So guys, this is a lot of very simple Apex stuff. If you, if you use the Apex reports, you can go and create your filters, for example. I can say target is that, or if I want to say, uh, I want to look at only activity on a particular object. So you know, for example, I want to look at what's happening on the employee table. All right, so this is limiting. Uh, all the activity is happening on the, on the employee's table. So you can see this is what's been happening. Some data to work on the table, some data to update the table. So you can turn on the filters here. I want to look at only recent activity. I want to look at all the old activity. So you can do that as well. Uh, the summary reports are also very useful. I want to look at trends. So I want to look at what's happening based on a particular day. So I know that this is the data for today. So I'm looking at this data, I want to know where is the main audit, audit activity coming from. So I can see in this case, this particular user has generated the most audit activity. Uh, and I can see the audit is based on select. And also somebody is connecting as root, for example, because I'm also uh, auditing enabled. So with the trend uh, or the summary reports, I can get an overall bird's eye view of the audit activity that's happening on the database for a particular day, for a particular time period. Uh, so let's have a look at another very useful report called entitlement report. So, so you can see what has actually changed. So I want to know at, okay, so let's do one thing. So system privileges, for example, I'm selecting my target and these snapshots. So remember I showed you the screen for entitlements, I can specify when I want the entitlements, uh, entitlements to be created. So if I specify a particular time interval, you'll see all the snapshots getting created based on that schedule. But if I want to compare two different baselines now, so I want to see this one and I want to compare it with the other one. 
uh, and a run go. So it's going to typically show everything that changed. That means no system privileges have actually changed. So let's try and go and uh, run to say DDA to HCM. Okay, so I'm going to go and connect to my database. So what I'm going to do out now, uh, here is that I already have an attachment report for this particular time. I want to generate another attachment report and then compare what's happened. Okay, so let's assume some days have passed. I want to know what about has changed in those in those particular days. So I'm just going to go now into targets, and I'm going to retrieve this right now. Okay. So you actually can go in here and see the status of jobs as well. You'll see all the different jobs that are completed. So there's lots of jobs that happen in the background. So if you should actually connect to your machine and select from the ABS scheduler jobs, you'll be able to see all those jobs that are running. So I can see here the jobs are still running this time. And this job is not completed. So now we have another baseline. So let's see what has changed. So I'm going to run the same report now, the entitlement report. And my snapshot would be, let's say that one, and compare it with the most recent snapshot. Okay, so that is not coming as yet, so this will for some time. You'll see that it will show that DB has been guarded. It will just it will come and say well. I think it's taking some time for the data to come through. But when I run it earlier, the first thing that you'll see out here is that it has changed. Still not coming. Let's give it a little more time. Let's try it once again. Okay, I'm not sure why that is not coming in. It should actually come in. For some reason it hasn't come in here as yet. But you would actually see it showing as changed because a privilege to respect the user has been changed since the time the last uh, interactions report was run. Sometimes because of the machine, it's, it may take a little time for the report to come in. But uh, I have tested this out on, on, on an actual production server and you can see it in a few minutes the report will reflect the change. So another report that's very useful is the uh, the transition report. So, so for example, I want to see like after sudo was run. So you can see I connected as root first, uh, and then I did a su to oracle, and then after I su to oracle, I want to know what SQL statements were run in the database. I can see uh, these are all the SQL statements that are run after I connected. Uh, as this particular user. So if you transition from one, one OS user to another and then you do some database activity, you can also generate some very uh, good reports because it's very important to know that after the whole transition has happened, uh, like from one user to another user, what database activity has transpired since then. So that information will also show up. Uh, I'll try to show you the enrolling. So I've just pulled out an actual script that I would be running. So to enroll a particular database, what I would do first is that I go and create a dedicated table space to store my data in my database. So this is my target database. So I specify a table space for my audit data. And then I go and change my audit location. So this is not my sysox table space, it's going to my new table space. And then I go and create jobs. So what this first job is doing is that after the data is going into the audit or repository, I typically don't need the data to collect in my database because the data is not either in EVP. I so I go and purge it from my database. And I go and create these first jobs, which could go and purge data. In this case, it's going to purge it every day. Okay. Then I go and create a user. So this is the user that we're going to create in the target database. 
And I think I showed you one of the streams where we have to specify the user and the password. So this user is created in each of the target databases that I want to enroll with AVTF. And then I have to go and grant the user some privileges. So this part out here, guys, is the path for the agent. So this is the agent I install. And in the agent uh, directory, there is a, a, a script that we need to run. That's called Oracle user setup.sql. And we provide a few parameters. One is the username and what is the mode. So there's three different modes, but it's called setup. So setup is uh, mandatory. And then I can have optionally, if I want to audit uh, what's called SPA or storage procedure auditing, I specify uh, that parameter as well, and also entitlement. So once I run these scripts, it goes and runs that to user some privileges that enables it to create uh, collect order data based on the uh, either stored procedures or documents, as the case may be. So I'm, I'm showing you an example of what actually is created in the background. When we go and uh, click on those boxes, I can show you the box was this one. Okay, so critical database activity, database schema changes, all are in activity. So there is a policy that gets created. So when you go and enable that, There'll be a policy or a AV dollar that means it's a policy that comes with the audit board. It's called critical DB activity. And then this policy actually has all these different uh, privileges that it's auditing. So you can go create your own policy if you want, but these are the policy that gets created automatically for you when you go and enable that through the GUI in AVDF. So you can go and create your own policies or you can use the ones that come out of the box. So you can see all these different uh, database activities are being audited out here. Now. So, so what I'm doing is this is I'm creating what's called a custom policy. So uh, I'm going to show you an example. So I want to create my own policy, and I want to audit all activity where they use the role DDA or data for export import. But I want to ensure that the user is not in this particular user list. So I don't want to audit this, I don't want to audit ABDF user, and I don't want to audit SNMP, DBSNMP. So I go and create the audit policy. And I can also create my own audit policy called all audit sys activity. So I'm interested in the user sys. When he connects directly to the database using SQL Plus, then I'm interested in auditing. So that means if I am on the server, and I'm issuing the SQL plus command, that means where my IP address is now null, but my user is sys, and the module that the user is using is SQL plus. So it, it becomes quite important. Suppose you want to audit all activity by a, a user who's connecting directly to database from the server itself, not coming through the application and not using tools like SQL developer or SQL, but using SQL plus from the host itself, then you can go and create your own custom audit policy and you can define the policy in such a way. So how you define the policy, there's lots of flexibility. It depends on what you use under here. So you use this context and if it's IP address, or current user, or module, or client program, or day of the week, or whatever, you can specify your own custom policy. Once you go and create all these policies, and it will actually show up here in the audit enabled unified policies. Audit Unified Enabled Policy, sorry, would show up all the different policies that you have enabled. So another thing I wanted to show you guys was the ADCLI. I just have a few minutes left. So let me just show you the ADCLI. So what we saw through the GUI, you can actually go and see it with ADCLI as well. So I'm just going to go into my Audit World Server now. So that's my Audit World Server. And I'm going to connect using ABCLL, that's my audit for uh, command line interface. And I can connect like this also, because what I've done, I've already stored the credentials for the user ABDF ADM. So this is user I, I'm connecting from here. So you know, I connect with a user. So the same user I'm basically specifying for the audit one. So I've already done that, I've stored the credentials. So once the credentials are stored, I can actually connect now like this. Okay, and then I can typically do everything that I did through the uh, console. Like if I want to register a target, I can do that. Now I've already, uh, sorry, I'm going to use it.
Okay, so you can see now I can use the ADM user and I can now list my targets. So very similar to what I see in the console. I can go and list my targets here. You can see both my targets are showing up. One is the database, one is the, uh, uh, the, the Unix machine itself. So I can list targets. I can start the agent from here, start the collection. I can also list my trails. So you can see out here. It's showing the unified audit trail. And if I want, I can go and script the whole thing. So I can create a file called enroll underscore db dot uh, av. And then I can run that script. So this is the contents of the script. I'm registering a target. I'm starting the, the collection. And then I'm listing a trail. So uh, rather than going into the GUI, I can automate the whole process by using the script. And then I can grow the script using ABCLR. So guys, I can spend a lot more time, but unfortunately my time is over for the day. Uh, you can drop me an email and contact me by uh, my email at postsolutions at gavinsurma.com. Uh, if you do have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them on board and uh, hope you guys start using this product in the future. Uh, be safe, take care, and look forward to catching up with you guys again and have a wonderful conference. Hope you visit all these sessions that have happened in the past few days and also coming up in the subsequent days as well. Thank you and take care. Hi, Gavin. Uh, we have a few, a couple questions in the chat. The first one is, is one of the assistants asking if you can share the PPT by email. Uh, another uh, secondary is asking, thank you, Gavin, for an amazing session. Can you please advise how AVDF differ from audit operations in o OEM? Yes, yeah, so what I can say, to answer a long question, short question in a long way, but, but in a very two-line two, two answer, I can say is that what you see in OEM is basically information that's there at that point in time. You don't see historical information. So what is stored in the repository is your audit data for yesterday, for a week before, maybe a year, okay? Whereas Enterprise Manager will only show you the data that's there in the unified audit trail table at that particular point in time. So if your table has been published, then you're not going to see data for the last month or the month before that. So the audit word is a repository. So like a, a repository, it's storing data for a long time and you can specify how long you want the data to be stored. So that is the big difference from Enterprise Manager. And the, report, the reports you see that I've shown you out here is not what you're going to see in Enterprise Manager. So there's no comparison in the reports that you can get from EVDF as compared to OEM. Again, OEM is at point in time, at that point in time, whereas the audit world is a repository and it's not only storing data for one database, but it's storing data for maybe hundreds of databases in one central place. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Hey guys, thanks a lot, uh, Francisco, and have a good evening. I'll, I'll log out for the time now. Thank you so much, Kavi. I was talking to myself and I forgot I was in mute. And now Ed, it's all good. And please take care and be safe. And thank you for your time today, uh, sharing your knowledge with the community in the Asia Pacific and now around the globe. And please, everyone, take care and be safe. And all the best for you if it's the morning, afternoon, or the evening, wherever you are. All the best, Kavi. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Francisco. Oh. CloudDB, shaping your new normal.